I just started a fire. Why don't you join me and warm up some? Oh, and Merry Christmas to you. For millennia, humans around the world have celebrated this time of year. Germanic and Nordic cultures of centuries past would celebrate Yuletide to celebrate the season for many days, usually as much as 12 days. By celebrate the season, I mean that in quite a literal sense. These early celebrations would often be about the winter solstice on December 21st. As is often the case with celebrations, religion would often be mixed in. For example, Yuletide was often associated with the god Odin, who many Germanic peoples thought would fly around in the night skies during Yuletide, deciding who would perish and who would prosper, something that usually was carried out through agricultural success or failure. One of the biggest empires in history was, of course, the Roman Empire. There, they didn't call it Yuletide, nor did they worship the Norse god Odin. Instead, they celebrated Saturnalia in honor of one of their gods, Saturn. For the Romans, Saturn was the god of agriculture, so during Saturnalia, they were hoping to appease Saturn in return for a favorable agricultural season. Looking back at these two very different celebrations, you can start to see a common thread of some sort some sort of deity making a decision on the good and bad. Sort of reminds you of another character deciding who's naughty or nice. Fast forward thousands of years, and five years after the American Civil War ended in 1865, the United States government officially turned Christmas Day into an American holiday. Five years and 26 days, to be precise, since the war ended with the final surrender of General Edmund Smith's troops on June 2, 1865, and Christmas was declared a federal holiday on June 28, 1870. So, that's a little fun fact for you. Christmas was not an official holiday during the Civil War. Of course, it was celebrated by a lot of Americans throughout the early 1800s, but it wasn't official until 1870. But wait, where are my manners? I'm getting carried away. I'm sorry, that, that happens with, with history sometimes, but the fireside here is, is warm and it's nice to warm up the outside, but it's so cold outside. I'm sure you're frozen to the core, so you need something warm to drink. I'm afraid I wasn't expecting guests, so I don't really have anything made up. I'll, I'll go into the kitchen and make you some hot chocolate. Tell you what, why don't you come with me? And while we're waiting for the kettle to warm up on the stove, I'll explain a little bit of the background to our first story. William Porter was born in North Carolina on September 11, 1862, just before Christmas became an official holiday. At only 19 years old, William became a licensed pharmacist after spending a couple years before that working in his uncle's drugstore in Greensboro, North Carolina. Then, stricken by an illness with symptoms that included constant coughing, William decided to go to Texas in hopes that the change in the air might help his sickness. It did help and for the next decade or so, he moved around Texas. For a while, he lived in Austin, where he worked as a pharmacist. Then it was in Austin that he met a woman named Ethel, who, despite herself having tuberculosis, would soon become William's bride. William and Ethel were married in 1887. Sadly, the marriage didn't last very long, as only 10 years later, Ethel succumbed to tuberculosis. She passed away in 1897. In 1902, at the age of 40, William began a new career as a writer. He moved to New York City and went on to write a story a week for the New York World Sunday magazine. But if you were to look through the stories he wrote, you'd almost never see his name in the byline. Like many writers, William decided to write under a pen name. When asked by the New York Times how he settled on his pen name, he explained, quote, it was during these New Orleans days that I adopted my pen name of O. Henry, 
I said to a friend, I'm going to send out some stuff. I don't know if it amounts to much, so I want to get a literary alias. Help me pick out a good one. He suggested that we get a newspaper and pick a name from the first list of notables that we found in it. In the society columns, we found the account of a fashionable ball. Here we have our notables, said he. We looked down the list and my eye lighted on the name Henry. That'll do for the last name, said I. Now for a first name. I want something short. None of your three syllable names for me. Why don't you use a plain initial letter then, asked my friend. Good, said I. O is about the easiest letter written. And O it is. A newspaper once wrote and asked me what the O stood for. I replied, O stands for Olivier, the French for Oliver. And several of my stories accordingly have appeared in that paper under the name Olivier Henry. If you've heard of O. Henry before, you'll probably know what story we're going to start off with. Written in 1905, O. Henry's The Gift of the Magi is a classic Christmas tale that has been told and retold in different variations over the centuries. Ah, it sounds like our kettle is done boiling. Here you go, here's a mug. All right, got your drink? Mm, I remember when I was a kid, it was freezing cold outside. I'd come inside after playing in the snow to my mom's mug of hot chocolate with... Wait, wait a second, you need some of these. There we go. Some marshmallows. There's nothing like hot chocolate with some marshmallows. Mm, perfect. <laughs> but there's a draft in here. Now that we have our hot drink, let's head back to the fireplace to stay warm. That feels great. Ready for our first story? Okay. Here is O. Henry's The Gift of the Magi. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. That was all. And sixty cents of it was in pennies. Pennies saved, one and two at a time, by bulldozing the grocer and the vegetable man and the butcher until one's cheeks burned with the silent imputation of parsimony that such close dealing implied. Three times Della counted it, one dollar and eighty-seven cents, and the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl, so Della did it, which instigates the moral reflection that life is made up of sobs, sniffles, and smiles, with sniffles predominating. While the mistress of the home is gradually subsiding from the first stage to the second, Take a look at the home, a furnished flat at $8 per week. It did not exactly beggar description, but it certainly had that word on the lookout for the mediancy squad. In the vestibule below was a letter box into which no letter would go, and an electric button from which no mortal finger could coax a ring. Also appertaining thereunto was a card bearing the name Mr. James Dillingham Young. The Dillingham had been flung to the breeze during a former period of prosperity when its possessor was being paid $30 per week. Now, when the income was shrunk to $20, though, they were thinking seriously of contracting to a modest and unassuming D. But whenever Mr. James Dillingham Young came home and reached his flat above, he was called Jim and greatly hugged by Mrs. James Dillingham Young, already introduced to you as Della which is all very good. Della finished her cry and attended to her cheeks with a powder rag. She stood by the window and looked out dully at a gray cat walking a gray fence in a gray backyard. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she had only $1.87 with which to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months with this result. $20 a week doesn't go far. Expenses had been greater than she had calculated. They always are. Only $1.87 to buy a present for Jim. Her Jim. Many a happy hour she had spent planning for something nice for him. Something fine and rare and sterling. Something just a little bit near to being worthy of the honor of being owned by Jim. There was a pier glass between the windows of the room. 
Perhaps you have seen a pier glass in an $8 flat. A very thin and very agile person may, by observing his reflection in a rapid sequence of longitudinal strips, obtain a fairly accurate conception of his looks. Della, being slender, had mastered the art. Suddenly, she whirled from the window and stood before the glass. Her eyes were shining brilliantly, but her face had lost its color within twenty seconds. Rapidly, she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now, there were two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Had the Queen of Sheba lived in the flat across the air shaft, Della would have let her hair hang out the window some day to dry just to depreciate Her Majesty's jewels and gifts. Had King Solomon been the janitor, with all his treasures piled up in the basement, Jim would have pulled out his watch every time as he passed, just to see him pluck at his beard from envy. So now, Della's beautiful hair fell about her rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knee and made itself almost a garment for her. And then she did it up again nervously and quickly. Once she faltered for a minute and stood still while a tear or two splashed on the worn red carpet. On went her old brown jacket. On went her old brown hat. With a whirl of skirts and with the brilliant sparkle still in her eye, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street. Where she stopped, the sign read Madame Safrani, hair goods of all kinds. One flight up, Della ran and collected herself, panting. Madame, large, too white, chilly, hardly looked like the Safrani. Will you buy my hair? asked Della. I buy hair, said Madame. Take off your hat and let's have a sight at the look of it. Down rippled the brown cascade. Twenty dollars, said Madame, lifting the mass with a practiced hand. Give it to me quick, said Della. Oh, the next two hours tripped by on rosy wings. Forget the hashed metaphor. She was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the stores, and she had turned all of them inside out. It was a platinum fob chain, simple and chaste in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone and not by meretricious ornamentation, as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be Jim's. It was like him. Quietness and value, the description applied to both. Twenty-one dollars they took from her for it and she hurried home with 87 cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it on the sly on the account of the old leather strap that he used in place of the chain. When Della reached her home, her intoxication gave way to a little prudence and reason. She got out her curling irons and lighted the gas and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love, which is always a tremendous task, dear friends, a mammoth task. Within forty minutes, her head was covered with tiny, clothesline curls that had made her look wonderfully like a trant schoolboy. She looked at her reflection in the mirror, long, carefully, and critically. If Jim doesn't kill me, she said to herself, before he takes a second look at me, he'll say I look like a Coney Island chorus girl. But what could I do? Oh, what could I do with a dollar and eighty-seven cents? At seven o'clock, the coffee was made and the frying pan was on the back of the stove, hot and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. Della doubled the fob chain in her hand and sat on the corner of the table near the door that he always entered. Then she heard his step on the stairway, down the first flight. She turned white for just a moment. She had a habit of saying things, a little silent prayer about the simplest everyday things, and now she whispered, Please, God, make him think I'm still pretty. The door opened, and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and very serious. Poor fellow, he was only twenty-two, and to be burdened with a family. He needed a new overcoat, and he was without gloves. Jim stopped inside the door, 
as immovable as a setter at the scent of quail. His eyes were fixed upon Della, and there was an expression in them that she could not read, and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, nor any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for. He simply stared at her fixedly with that peculiar expression on his face. Della wriggled off the table and went for him. Jim, darling, she cried, don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say, Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a beautiful, nice gift I've got for you. You've cut off your hair? asked Jim, laboriously, as if he had not arrived at that patent fact yet, even after the hardest mental labor. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. Don't you like me just as well, anyhow? I'm me without my hair, ain't I? Jim looked around the room curiously. You, you say your hair is gone, he said, with an air of almost idiocy. You needn't look for it, said Della. It's sold, I tell you, sold and gone, too. It's Christmas Eve, boy. Be good to me, for it went for you. Maybe the hairs of my head were numbered, she went on with sudden serious sweetness, but nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I put on the chops, Jim? Out of his trance, Jim seemed quickly to wake. He unfolded his Della. For ten seconds, let us regard with discreet scrutiny some inconsequential object in the other direction. Eight dollars a week or a million a year. What is the difference? A mathematician or a wit would give you the wrong answer. The Magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. This dark assertion will be illuminated later on. Jim drew a package from his overcoat and threw it on the table. Don't make any mistake, Dell, he said, about me. I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut or a shave or a shampoo that could make me like my girl any less. But if you all unwrap that package, you may see why you had me going a while at first. White fingers and nimble tore at the string and paper, and then an ecstatic scream of joy, and then, alas, a quick feminine change to hysterical tears and wails, necessitating the immediate employment of all the comforting powers of the lord of the flat, for there lay the combs. The set of combs, side and back, that Della had worshipped long in a Broadway window, Beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell with jeweled rims, just the shade to wear in the beautiful vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had simply craved and yearned over them without the least hope of possession. And now they were hers. But the tresses that should have adorned the coveted adornments were gone. But she hugged them to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and a smile and say, my hair grows so fast, Jim. And then Della leaped up like a little singed cat and cried, Oh, oh, Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him eagerly upon her open palm. The dull, precious metal seemed to flash with a reflection of her bright and ardent spirit. Isn't it dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks with it on. Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Dell, he said, let's put our Christmas presents away and, and keep them a while. They're too nice to use just at present. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs. And now, suppose you put the chops on. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger they invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are wisest. Everywhere they are wisest. They are the Magi.
What'd you think? I love that story. Did you find a moral in the story? For me, the moral was about how there were these two people quite obviously in love with each other, but they cared so much about outward appearances. Della with her hair that she dreamed about showing off to the Queen of Sheba, and Jim with his watch that he fancied checking the time on just to show off in front of King Solomon. Those are both biblical characters, by the way, so obviously they weren't really there, but the author uses these examples of the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon really to let us know how much Jim and Della in the story cared so much about what others thought. And really also the possessions that they loved to show off to others, Della with her hair and Jim with his watch. But in the end, those possessions didn't mean anything. They're willing to give away the things that they care about most for the person that they love the most, each other. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I always thought that that was a great story about the season of Christmas. It's not about stuff. It's not about presents. It's not about outward appearances or what other people think about us. It's about love. Being with loved ones and showing them how much you care for them. That's something I think the world can use more of, not just this time of year, but really all year round. I hope you enjoyed it too. Oh, it looks like you're out of hot chocolate. Hey, tell you what, want some hot apple cider? That's another hot drink from my childhood. See, I, I grew up just outside of Cleveland, Ohio, and I loved playing in the snow. My brothers and I, we used to make massive snow forts out of the snow that got piled high at the end of the driveway after the snow plow cleared our street. That snow was way taller than us kids, but we burrowed into it and established our own little kingdoms. Or most of the time, we ended up just having good-natured snowball fights with our friends. Some days, we'd be out there playing from sunup to sundown. I really realized how cold I was when I came back inside. But my mom had a huge coffee dispenser. I, I don't really know where she got it. I just remember there was a big blue one that said Maxwell House on the side. I didn't drink coffee back then. <laughs> that was before my caffeine days. But... She used to fill it with hot apple cider instead for us kids. That way, any time it was cold outside, we'd always be able to come inside to a hot drink. Anyway, you're not here to listen to my nostalgia. Where was I? Oh yeah, the hot apple cider. You stay here by the fire. I'll go get you some. Alrighty, hot drink in hand. You ready for another story? So, the author of our next story has something sort of in common with the last one. While William Porter, or O. Henry, might have been a pharmacist turned author, our next story comes from someone who was a physician turned author. Born in 1859, Arthur went into the medical field after studying at the University of Edinburgh Medical School from 1876 to 1881. While he was there in 1879, Arthur published his first story for Chambers's Edinburgh Journal. Then, exactly two weeks later, he'd publish his first academic article in the British Medical Journal. Thirteen years later, in January of 1892, he wrote a short story with his most beloved characters set around Christmas. By now, if you haven't figured it out, I'm talking about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and his lovable characters, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Ready for a Sherlock Holmes Christmas story? This is The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle. I had called upon my friend Sherlock Holmes upon the second morning after Christmas with the intention of wishing him the compliments of the season. He was lounging upon the sofa in a purple dressing gown, a pipe rack within his reach upon the right, and a pile of crumpled morning papers, evidently newly studied, near at hand. Beside the couch was a wooden chair, and on the angle of the back hung a very seedy and disreputable, heartfelt hat, much the worse for wear and cracked in several places. A lens and a forceps lying on the seat of the chair suggested that the hat had been suspended in this manner for the purpose of examination. "'You are engaged,' said I. "'Perhaps I interrupt you.' "'Not at all. "'I am glad to have a friend with whom I can discuss my results. "'The matter is a perfectly trivial one.' "'He jerked his thumb in the direction of the old hat. 
but there are points in connection with it which are not entirely devoid of interest and even of instruction. I seated myself in the armchair and warmed my hands before his crackling fire, for the sharp frost had set in, and the windows were thick with the ice crystals. I suppose, I remarked, that, homely as it looks, this thing has some deadly story linked onto it, that it is the clue which will guide you in the solution of some mystery and the punishment of some crime. Oh, no, no crime, said Sherlock Holmes, laughing. Only one of those whimsical little incidents which will happen when you have four million human beings all jostling each other within the space of a few square miles. Amid the action and reaction of those dense a swarm of humanity, every possible combination of events may be expected to take place, and many a little problem will be presented, which may be striking and bizarre without being criminal. We have already had experience of such. So much so, I remarked, that of the last six cases which I have added to my notes, three have been entirely free of any legal crime. Precisely. You allude to my attempt to recover the Irene Adler's papers, to the singular case of Miss Mary Sutherland, and to the adventure of the man with the twisted lip. Well, I have no doubt that this small matter will fall into the same innocent category. You know Peterson, the commissioner? Yes. It is to him that this trophy belongs. It is his hat. No, no, he found it. Its owner is unknown. I beg that you will look upon it not as a battered billycock, but as an intellectual problem. And first, as to how it came here, it arrived upon Christmas morning, in company with a good fat goose, which is, I have no doubt, roasting at this moment in front of Peterson's fire. The facts are these. About four o'clock on Christmas morning, Peterson, who, as you know, is a very honest fellow, was returning from some small jollification and was making his way homeward down Tottenham Court Road. In front of him, he saw, in the gaslight, a tallish man walking with a slight stagger and carrying a white goose slung over his shoulder. As he reached the corner of Googe Street, a row broke out between this stranger and a little knot of roughs. One of the latter knocked off the man's hat, on which he raised his stick to defend himself, and, swinging it over his head, smashed the shop window behind him. Peterson had rushed forward to protect the stranger from his assailants, but the man, shocked at having broken the window and seeing an official-looking person in uniform rushing toward him, dropped his goose, took to his heels, and vanished amid the labyrinth of small streets which lie at the back of Tottenham Court Road. The roughs had also fled at the appearance of Peterson, so that he was left in possession of the field of battle and also of the spoils of victory in the shape of this battered hat and the most unimpeachable Christmas goose, which surely he restored to the owner? My dear fellow, there lies the problem. It is true that for Mrs. Henry Baker was printed on a small card which was tied to the bird's left leg. And it's also true that the initials HB are legible upon the lining of this hat. But there are some thousands of bakers and some hundreds of Henry Bakers in this city of ours, and it's not easy to restore lost property to any of them. What then did Peterson do? He brought round both hat and goose to me on Christmas morning, knowing that even the smallest problems are of interest to me. The goose we retained until this morning when there were signs that, in spite of the slight frost, it would be well that it should be eaten without unnecessary delay. Its finder has carried it off, therefore, to fulfill the ultimate destiny of a goose, while I continue to retain the hat of the unknown gentleman who lost his Christmas dinner. Did he not advertise? No. Then what clue could you have as to his identity? Only as much as we can deduce. From his hat? Precisely. But you are joking. What can you gather from this old battered felt? Here is my lens. You know my methods. What can you gather yourself as to the individuality of a man who has worn this article? I took the tattered object in my hands, and I turned it over rather ruefully. It was a very ordinary black hat of the usual round shape, hard and much the worse for wear. 
The lining had been of red silk, but it was a good deal discolored. There was no maker's name, but as Holmes had remarked, the initials HB were scrawled upon one side. It was pierced in the brim for a hat securer, but the elastic was missing. For the rest, it was cracked, exceedingly dusty, and spotted in several places, although there seemed to have been an attempt to hide the discolored patches by smearing them with ink. I, I can see nothing, said I, handing it back to my friend. On the contrary, Watson, you can see everything. You fail, however, to reason from what you see. You are too timid in drawing your inferences. Then, pray tell me what it is that you can infer from this hat. He picked it up and gazed at it in the peculiar introspective fashion which was characteristic of him. It is perhaps less suggestive than it might have been, he remarked, and yet there are a few inferences which are very distinct, and a few others which represent at least a strong balance of probability. That the man was highly intellectual is, of course, obvious upon the face of it, and also that he was fairly well-to-do within the last three years, although he has now fallen upon evil days. He had foresight, but has less now than formerly, pointing to a moral retrogression which, when taken with the decline of his fortunes, seems to indicate some evil influence, probably drink, at work upon him. This may account also for the obvious fact that his wife has ceased to love him. My dear Holmes, he has, however, retained some degree of self-respect, he continued, disregarding my remonstrance. He is a man who leads a sedentary life goes out little, is out of training entirely, is middle-aged, has grizzled hair, which has been cut within the last few days, in which he anoints with lime cream. These are the more patent facts which are to be deduced from his hat. Also, by the way, that it is extremely improbable that he has gas laid on in his house. You are certainly joking, Holmes. Not in the least. It is possible that even now, when I give you these results, you are unable to see how they are attained. I have no doubt that I'm very stupid, but I must confess that I'm unable to follow you. For example, how did you deduce that this man was intellectual? For answer, Holmes clapped the hat upon his head. It came right over his forehead and settled upon the bridge of his nose. It is a question of cubic capacity, said he. A man with so large a brain must have something in it. The decline of his fortunes then? This hat is three years old. These flat brims curled at the edge came in then. It is a hat of the very best quality. Look at the band of ribbed silk and the excellent lining. If this man could afford to buy so expensive a hat three years ago and has had no hat since, then he has assuredly gone down in the world. Well, that is clear enough, certainly. But how about the foresight and the moral retrogression? Sherlock Holmes laughed. Here is the foresight. He said, putting his finger upon the little disc and loop of the hat secure. They are never sold upon hats. If this man ordered one, it is a sign of a certain amount of foresight, since he went out of his way to take this precaution against the wind. But since we see that he has broken the elastic and is not troubled to replace it, it is obvious that he has less foresight now than formerly, which is a distinct proof of a weakening nature. On the other hand, he has endeavored to conceal some of these stains upon the felt by daubing them with ink, which is a sign that he has not entirely lost his self-respect. Your reasoning is certainly plausible. The further points that he is middle-aged and that his hair is grizzled and that it has been recently cut and that he now uses lime cream are all to be gathered from a close examination of the lower part of the lining. The lens discloses a large number of hair ends clean cut by the scissors of a barber. They all appear to be adhesive, and there is a distinct odor of lime cream. This dust, you will observe, is not the gritty gray dust of the street, but the fluffy brown dust of a house, showing that it has been hung up indoors most of the time, while the marks of moisture upon the inside are proof positive that the wearer perspired very freely, and therefore hardly could be in the best of training. But his wife, you, you said that she had ceased to love him. This hat has not been brushed for weeks. When I see you, my dear Watson, with a week's accumulation of dust upon your hat and when your wife allows you to go out in such a state, I fear that you will also have been unfortunate enough to lose your wife's affection. 
but he might be a bachelor. Nay, he was bringing home a goose as a peace offering to his wife. Remember the card upon the bird's leg? You have an answer to everything, but how on earth do you deduce that the gas is not laid on in his house? One tallow stain or even two might come by chance, but when I see no less than five, I think that there can be little doubt that the individual must be brought into frequent contact with burning tallow. Walks upstairs at night, probably with his hat in one hand and a guttering candle in the other. Anyhow, he never got tallow stains from a gas jet. Are you satisfied? Well, it is very ingenious, said I, laughing. But since you have just said now that there is no crime committed and no harm done save the loss of a goose, all this seems to be rather a waste of energy. Sherlock Holmes had opened his mouth to reply when the door flew open and Peterson, the commissioner, rushed into the apartment with flushed cheeks and a face of a man who was dazed with astonishment. The goose, Mr. Holmes, the goose, sir, he gasped. Eh, what of it then? Has it returned to life and flapped off through the kitchen window? Holmes twisted himself around upon the sofa to get a fairer view of the man's excited face. See here, sir, see what my wife found in its crop. He held out his hand and displayed upon the center of the palm was a brilliantly scintillating blue stone, rather smaller than the size of a bean, but of such purity and radiance that it twinkled like an electric point in the dark hollow of his hand. Sherlock Holmes sat up with a whistle. By Jove, Peterson, he said, this is a treasure trove indeed. I suppose you know what you've got? A diamond, sir? A precious stone? It cuts into glass as though it were putty. It's more than a precious stone. It's the precious stone. Not the Countess of Morcar's blue carbuncle, I ejaculated. Precisely so. I ought to know its size and shape, seeing that I have read the advertisement about it in the Times every day lately. It is absolutely unique, and its value can only be conjectured, but the reward offered of a thousand pounds is certainly not within a twentieth part of the market price. A thousand pounds? Great Lord of mercy, the commissioner plumped down into a chair and stared from one to the other of us. That is the reward, and I have reason to know that there are sentimental considerations in the background which would induce the countess to part with half her fortune if she could but recover the gem. It was lost, if I remember her right, at the Hotel Cosmopolitan, I remarked. Precisely so, on December 22nd, just five days ago, John Horner, a plumber, was accused of having abstracted it from the lady's jewel case. The evidence against him was so strong that the case has been referred to the assizes. I have some account of the matter here, I believe. He rummaged amid his newspapers, glancing over the dates until, at last, he smoothed one out, doubled it over, and read the following paragraph. Hotel Cosmopolitan Jewel Robbery John Horner 26, Plummer, was brought up upon the charge of having upon the 22nd abstracted from the jewel case of the Countess of Morcar the valuable gem known as the Blue Carbuncle. James Ryder, upper attendant at the hotel, gave his evidence to the effect that he had shown Horner up to the dressing room of the Countess Morcar upon the day of the robbery in order that he might solder a second bar of the grate, which was loose. He had remained with Horner some little time, but had finally been called away. On returning, he found that Horner had disappeared, that the bureau had been forced open, and that the small Morocco casket in which, as it afterwards transpired, the Countess was accustomed to keeping her jewel was lying empty upon the dressing table. Ryder instantly gave the alarm, and Horner was arrested the same evening, but the stone could not be found either upon his person or in his rooms. Catherine Cusack, maid to the Countess, deposed of having heard Ryder's cry of dismay upon discovering the robbery, and to having rushed into the room where she found matters as described by the last witness. Inspector Bradstreet, B Division, gave evidence as to the arrest of Horner, who struggled frantically and protested his innocence in the strongest terms. Evidence of a previous conviction for robbery having been given against the prisoner, the magistrate refused to deal summarily with the offense, but referred it to the assizes. Horner, who had been shown signs of intense emotion during the proceedings, fainted away at the conclusion and was carried out of court. Huh. 
so much for the police court, said Holmes thoughtfully, tossing aside the paper. The question for us now to solve is the sequence of events leading from a rifled jewel case at one end to the crop of a goose in Tottenham Court Road at the other. You see, Watson, our little deductions have suddenly assumed a much more important and less innocent aspect. Here is the stone. The stone came from the goose, and the goose came from Mr. Henry Baker, the gentleman with the bad hat and all the other characteristics with which I have bored you. So now we must set ourselves very seriously to finding this gentleman and ascertaining what part he has played in this little mystery. To do this, we must try the simplest means first, and these lie undoubtedly in an advertisement in all the evening papers. If this fails, I shall have recourse to other methods. What will you say? Give me a pencil and that slip of paper. Now then. Found at the corner of Gooch Street, a goose and a black felt hat. Mr. Henry Baker can have the same by applying at 6.30 this evening at 221B Baker Street. That is clear and concise. Very. But will he see it? Well, he is sure to keep an eye on the paper since to a poor man the loss was a heavy one. He was clearly so scared by his mischance in breaking the window and by the approach of Peterson that he thought of nothing but flight. But since then, he must have bitterly regretted the impulse which caused him to drop his bird. Then, again, the introduction of his name will cause him to see it, for everyone who knows him will direct his attention to it. Here you are, Peterson. Run down to the advertising agency and have this put in the evening papers. In which, sir? Oh, in the Globe. Star, Paul Mall, St. James, Evening News, Standard, Echo, and any others that occur to you. Very well, sir. And this stone? Ah, yes. I, I shall keep the stone. Thank you. And I say, Peterson, just buy a goose on your way back and leave it here with me, for we must have one to give to this gentleman in place of the one which your family is now devouring. When the commissionaire had gone, Holmes took up the stone and held it against the light. It's a bonny thing, said he. Just see how it glints and sparkles. Of course, it is a nucleus and focus of crime. Every good stone is. They are the devil's pet baits. In the larger and older jewels, every facet may stand for a bloody deed. This stone is not yet twenty years old. It was found in the banks of the Amoy River in southern China, and is remarkable in having every characteristic of the carbuncle, save that it is blue in shade instead of ruby red. In spite of its youth, it already has a sinister history. There have been two murders, a vitriol throwing, a suicide, and several robberies brought about for the sake of this 40 grain weight of crystallized charcoal. Who would think that so pretty a toy would be a purveyor to the gallows and, and the prison? I'll lock it up in my strong box now and drop a line to the countess to say that we have it. Do you think this man Horner is innocent? I cannot tell. Well then, do you imagine that this other one, Henry Baker, had anything to do with the manor? It is, I think, much more likely that Henry Baker is an absolutely innocent man who had no idea that the bird which he was carrying was of considerably more value than if it was made of solid gold. That, however, I shall determine by a very simple test if we have an answer to our advertisement. And you can do nothing until then? Nothing. In that case, I shall continue my professional round, but I shall come back in the evening at the hour you have mentioned, for I should like to see the solution of so tangled a business. Very glad to see you. I dine at seven. There is a woodcock, I believe, by the way, in view of recent occurrences. Perhaps I ought ask Mrs. Hudson to examine its crop. I had been delayed at a case, and it was a little after half past six when I found myself in Baker Street once more. As I approached the house, I saw a tall man in a scotch bonnet with a coat which was buttoned up to his chin, waiting outside the bright semicircle which was thrown from the fanlight. Just as I arrived, the door was open, and we were shown up together to Holmes's room. Mr. Henry Baker, I believe, said he, rising from his armchair and greeting his visitor with an easy air of geniality which he could so readily assume. Pray take this chair by the fire, Mr. Baker. It is a cold night, and I observe that your circulation is more adapted for summer than winter. Ah, Watson, you have come just at the right time. Is that your hat, Mr. Baker? Yes, sir. That is undoubtedly my hat. 
He was a large man with rounded shoulders, a massive head, and a broad, intelligent face sloping down to a pointed beard of grizzled brown. A touch of red in nose and cheeks and a slight tremor of his extended hand recalled Holmes's surmise as to his habits. His rusty black frock coat was buttoned right up in front with a collar turned up and his lank wrists protruded from his sleeves without a sign of cuff or shirt. He spoke in a slow, staccato fashion, choosing his words with care and gave the general impression of a man of learning and letters who had had ill usage at the hands of fortune. We have retained these things for some days, said Holmes, because we expected to see an advertisement from you giving your address. I am at a loss to know now why you did not advertise. Our visitor gave a rather shamefaced laugh. Shillings have not been so plentiful with me as they once were, he remarked. I had no doubt that the game of roughs who assaulted me had carried off both my hat and the bird. I did not care to spend more money in a hopeless attempt at recovering them. Very naturally. By the way, about the bird, we were compelled to eat it. To eat it? Our visitor half rose from his chair in excitement. Yes, it would have been of no use to anyone had we not done so, but I presume that this other goose upon the sideboard, which is about the same weight and perfectly fresh, will answer your purpose equally well. Oh, certainly, certainly, answered Mr. Baker with a sigh of relief. Of course, we still have the feathers, legs, crop, and so on of your bird, if you so wish. The man burst into a hearty laugh. They might be useful to me as relics of my adventure, he said, but beyond that I can hardly see what the use of disjecta membra of my late acquaintance are going to be to me. No, sir, I think that with your permission I will confine my attentions to the excellent bird which I perceive upon the sideboard. Sherlock Holmes glanced sharply across at me with a slight shrug of his shoulders. There is your hat, then, and there your bird, said he. By the way, would it bore you to tell me where you got the other one from? I am somewhat of a foul fancier, and I have seldom seen a better grown goose. Certainly, sir, said Baker, who had risen and tucked his newly gained property under his arm. There are a few of us who frequent the Alpha Inn near the museum. We are to be found in the museum itself during the day, you understand. This year, our good host, Windigate by name, instituted a goose club by which, on consideration of some few pence every week, we were to each receive a bird at Christmas. My pence were duly paid, and the rest is familiar to you. I am much indebted to you, sir, for a Scotch bonnet is fitted neither to my years nor my gravity. With a comical pompousy of manner, he bowed solemnly to both of us and strode off upon his way. So much for Mr. Henry Baker, said Holmes, when he had closed the door behind him. It is quite certain that he knows nothing whatsoever about the matter. Are you hungry, Watson? Not particularly. Then I suggest we turn our dinner into a supper and follow this clue while it's still hot. By all means. It was a bitter night, so we drew on our ulsters and wrapped cravats about our throats. Outside, the stars were shining coldly in a cloudless sky, and the breath of the passers-by blew out into smoke like so many pistol shots. Our footfalls rang out crisply and loudly as we swung through the doctor's quarters, Wimple Street, Harley Street, and so through to Wigmore Street and into Oxford Street. In a quarter of an hour, we were in Bloomsbury at the Alpha Inn, which is a small public house at the corner of those streets which runs down to Holborn. Holmes pushed open the door of the private bar and ordered two glasses of beer from the ruddy-faced, white-aproned landlord. "'Your beer should be excellent if it is as good as your geese,' said he. "'My geese?' the man seemed surprised. "'Yes, I was speaking only half an hour ago to Mr. Henry Baker, who was a member of your goose club.' "'Ah, yes, I see.' Uh, but you see, sir, them's not our geese. Indeed. Whose then? Well, I got the two dozen from a salesman in Covent Garden. Indeed, 
I know some of them. Which was it? Breckenridge was his name. Ah, I don't know him. Well, here's to your good health, landlord, and prosperity to your house. Good night. Now for Mr. Breckenridge, he continued, buttoning up his coat as we came out into the frosty air. Remember, Watson, that though we have so homely a thing as a goose at one end of this chain, we have at the other a man who will certainly get seven years penal servitude unless we can establish his innocence. It is possible that our inquiry may but confirm his guilt, but in any case we have a line of investigation which has been missed by the police and which a singular chance has been placed in our hands. Let us follow it out to the bitter end. Faces to the south, then, and quick march. We passed across Holborn, down Endell Street, and so through a zigzag of slums to Covent Garden Market. One of the largest stalls bore the name of Breckenridge upon it, and the proprietor, a horsey-looking man with a sharp face and trim side whiskers, was helping a boy put up the shutters. Good evening. It's a cold night, said Holmes. The salesman nodded and shot a questioning glance at my companion. Sold out of geese, I see, continued Holmes, pointing at the bare slabs of marble. Let you have 500 tomorrow morning. That's no good. Well, there are some on the stall with the gas flare. Ah, but I was recommended to you. Who by? The landlord of the Alpha. Ah, yes, I sent him a couple of dozen. Fine birds they were, too. Now, where did you get them from? To my surprise, the question provoked a burst of anger from the salesman. Now then, mister, said he, with his head cocked and his arms akimbo, what are you driving at? Let's have it straight now. It is straight enough. I should like to know who sold you the geese which you supplied to the Alpha. Well, then, I shan't tell you. So now. Oh, it is a matter of no importance, but I don't know why you would be so warm over such a trifle. Warm? You'd be as warm, maybe, if you were as pestered as I am. When I pay good money for a good article, there should be an end of the business. But it's, where are the geese? And who did you sell the geese to? And what will you take for the geese? One would think they were the only geese in the world to hear the fuss that is made over them. Well, I have no connection with any other people who have been making inquiries, said Holmes carelessly. But if you won't tell us, the bet is off, and that is all. But I'm always ready to back my opinion on a matter of fowls, and I have a fiver on it that the bird I ate is country bred. Well, then you've lost your fiver, for it is town bred, snapped the salesman. It is nothing of the kind. I say it is. I don't believe it. Do you think you know more about fowls than I, who have handled them ever since I was a nipper? Well... I'll tell you those birds that went to the Alpha Inn were town bred. You'll never persuade me to believe that. Will you bet then? It's merely taking your money, for I know that I am right. But I'll have a sovereign on with you, just to teach you not to be obstinate. The salesman chuckled grimly. Bring me the books, Bill, said he. The small boy brought round a small, thin volume and a great greasy-backed one, laying them out together beneath the hanging lamp. Now then, Mr. Cocksure, said the salesman, I thought that I was out of geese, but before I finish, you'll find that there is still one left in my shop. You see this little book? Well, that's the list of the folk from whom I buy. Do you see? Well, then, here on this page are the country folk, and the numbers after their names are where their accounts are in the big ledger. Now then, you see this other page in red ink? Well, that is the list of my town suppliers. Now look at that third name. Just read it out to me. Mrs. Oakshot, 117 Brixton Road, 249, Red Holmes. Quite so. Now turn that up in the ledger. Holmes turned to the page indicated. Here you are. Mrs. Oakshot, 117 Brixton Road, Egg and Poultry Supplier. Now then, what's the last entry? December 22nd, 24 geese at 7 shillings and 6 pence. Quite so, there you are. And underneath, sold to Mr. Windigate of the Alpha at 12 shillings. What have you to say now? Sherlock Holmes looked deeply chagrined. 
He drew a sovereign from his pocket and threw it down upon the slab, turning away with the air of a man whose disgust is too deep for words. A few yards off, he stopped under a lamppost and laughed in a hearty, noiseless fashion, which was peculiar to him. When you see a man with whiskers of that cut and the pinkin protruding out of his pocket, you can always draw him by a bet, said he. I dare say that if I had put down a hundred pounds in front of him, that man would not have given me such complete information as was drawn from him by the idea that he was doing me on a wager. Well, Watson, we are, I fancy, nearing the end of our quest, and the only point which remains to be determined is whether we should go on to this Mrs. Oakshot tonight, or whether we should reserve it for tomorrow. It is clear from what that surly fellow said that there are others besides ourselves who are anxious about the matter, and I should... His remarks were suddenly cut short by a loud hubbub which broke out from the stall which we had just left. Turning round, we saw a little rat-faced fellow standing in the center of the circle of yellow light which was thrown by the swinging lamp, while Breckenridge, the salesman, framed in the door of his stall, was shaking his fist fiercely at the cringing figure. "'I've had enough of you and your geese,' he shouted. "'I wish you were all the devil together. If you come pestering me any more with your silly talk, I'll set the dog at you.' You bring Mrs. Oakshot here, and I'll answer her. But what have you to do with it? Did I buy the geese off you? No, but one of them was mine all the same, whined the little man. Well, then, ask Mrs. Oakshot for it. She told me to ask you. Well, you can ask the King of Perusa, for all I care. I've had enough of it. Get out of this. He rushed fiercely forward, and the inquirer flitted away into the darkness. Ha! Huh. This may save us a visit to Brixton Road, whispered Holmes. Come with me and we will see what is to be made of this fellow. Striding through the scattered knots of people who lounged around the flaring stalls, my companion speedily overtook the little man and touched him on the shoulder. He sprang round and I could see in the gas light it, every vestige of color had been driven from his face. Who are you then? What do you want? He said in a quavering voice. You will excuse me, said Holmes blandly, but I could not help overhearing the questions which you put to the salesman just now. I think that I could be of assistance to you. You? Who are you? How could you know anything of this matter? My name is Sherlock Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. But you can know nothing of this. Excuse me, I know everything of it. You are endeavoring to trace some geese which were sold by Mrs. Oakshot of Brixton Road to a salesman named Breckenridge. By him, in turn, to Mr. Windigate of the Alpha, and by him, to this club of which Mr. Henry Baker is a member. Oh, sir, you are the very man on whom I have longed to meet, cried the little fellow with outstretched hands and quivering fingers. I can hardly explain to you how interested I am in this matter. Sherlock Holmes hailed a four-wheeler which was passing. In that case, we had better discuss it in a cozy room rather than this windswept marketplace, said he. But pray tell me, before we go further... Who is it that I have the pleasure of assisting? The man hesitated for an instant. My name is John Robinson, he answered with a sidelong glance. No, no, the real name, said Holmes sweetly. It is always awkward doing business with an alias. A flush sprang to the white cheeks of the stranger. Well then, said he, my, my real name is, is James Ryder. Precisely so. Head attendant at the Hotel Cosmopolitan. Pray step into this cab, and I shall soon be able to tell you everything which you would wish to know. The little man stood glancing from one to the other of us with half-frightened, half-hopeful eyes, as one who is not sure whether he is on the verge of a windfall or of a catastrophe. Then he stepped into the cab, and in a half an hour we were back in the sitting room at Baker Street. Nothing had been said during our drive, but the high, thin breathing of our new companion and the claspings and unclaspings of his hand spoke to the nervous tension within him. "'Here we are,' said Holmes cheerily as we filed into the room. "'The fire looks very seasonable in this weather. You look cold, Mr. Ryder. Pray take the basket chair. I will just put on my slippers before we settle this little matter of yours. Now then, you want to know what became of those geese?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Or, rather, I fancy, of that goose.' It was one bird, I imagine, in which you were interested. White, with a black bar across the tail. Ryder quivered with emotion. Oh, sir, he cried. Can, can, can you tell me where it went to? It came here. Here? Yes, and a most remarkable bird, it proved. I don't know that you should take an interest in it. 
It laid an egg after it was dead. The bonniest, brightest little blue egg that was ever seen. I have it here in my museum. Our visitor staggered to his feet, clutched the mantelpiece with his right hand. Holmes unlocked a strong box and held up the blue carbuncle, which shone out like a star with a cold, brilliant, many-pointed radiance. Ryder stood glaring with a drawn face, uncertain whether to claim or disown it. The game's up, Ryder, said Holmes quietly. Hold up, man, or you'll be into the fire. Give him an arm back into his chair, Watson. He's not got blood enough to go in for felony with impunity. Give him a dash of brandy. So, now he looks a little more human. What a shrimp it is, to be sure. For a moment, he staggered and nearly fallen, but the brandy brought a tinge of color into his cheeks, and he sat staring with frightened eyes at his accuser. I have almost every link in my hands, and all the proofs which I could possibly need, so... There is little which I need you to tell me. Still, that little may as well be cleared up to make the case complete. You had heard, Ryder, of this blue stone of the Countess of Morcars. It was Catherine Cusack who told me of it, he said in a crackling voice. I, I see her ladyship's waiting maid. Well, the temptation of sudden wealth so easily acquired was too much for you as it had been for better men before you, but you were not very scrupulous in the means you used. It seems to me, Ryder, that there is the making of a very pretty villain in you. You knew that this man, Horner, the plumber, had been concerned in some such matter before, and that suspicion could rest the more readily upon him. What did you do then? You made some small job in my lady's room, you and your confederate Cusack, and you managed that he should be the man sent for. Then, when he had left, you rifled the jewel case, raised the alarm, and had this unfortunate man arrested. You then, Ryder threw himself down suddenly upon the rug and clutched at my companion's knees. For God's sake, have mercy, he shrieked. Think of my father, of my mother. It would break their hearts. I never went wrong before. I will never again. I swear it. I swear on the Bible. No, don't bring it into court. For Christ's sakes, don't. Get back into your chair, said Holmes sternly. It is very well to cringe and crawl now, but you thought little enough of this poor Horner in the dock for a crime of which he knew nothing. I will fly, Mr. Holmes. I will leave the country, sir. Then the charge against him will break down. Hmm. We will talk about that. And now, let us hear a true account of the next act. How came the stone into the goose, and how came the goose into the open market? Tell us the truth, for there lies your only hope of safety. Ryder passed his tongue over his parched lips. I will tell you it just as it happened, sir, said he. When Horner had been arrested, it seemed to me that it would be best for me to get away with the stone at once, for I did not know at what moment the police might not take it into their heads to search me and my room. There was no place about the hotel where it would be safe. I went out, as if on some commission, and I made for my sister's house. She had married a man named Oakshot and lived in Brixton Road, where she fattened fowls for the market. All the way there, every man I met seemed to me to be a policeman or a detective. And, for all that was a cold night, the sweat was pouring down on my face before I came to Brixton Road. My sister asked me what was the matter and why I was so pale, but I told her that I had been upset by the jewel robbery at the hotel. Then I went into the backyard and smoked a pipe and wondered what it would be best to do. I had a friend once called Maudsley who went to the bad and has just been serving his time in Pentonville. One day, he had met me and fell into talk about the ways of thieves and how they would get rid of what they stole. I knew that he would be true to me, for I knew one or two things about him, so I made up my mind to go right on to Kilburn, where he lived, and take him into my confidence. He would show me how to turn the stone into money, but how to get it to him in safety. I thought of the agonies I had gone through in coming from the hotel. I might at any moment be seized and searched, and there would be the stone in my waistcoat pocket. I was leaning against the wall at the time and looking at the geese which were waddling around my feet. And suddenly, an idea came into my head which showed me how I could beat the best detective that ever lived. 
My sister had told me some weeks before that I might have the pick of her geese for a Christmas present, and I knew that she was always as good as her word. I would take my goose now, and in it I would carry my stone to Kilburn. There was a little shed in the yard, and behind this I drove one of the birds, a fine big one, white with a barred tail. I caught it, and prying its bill open, I thrust the stone down its throat as far as my finger could reach. The bird gave a gulp, and I felt the stone pass along its gullet and down into its crop. But the creature flapped and struggled, and out came my sister to know what was the matter. As I turned to speak to her, the brute broke loose and fluttered off among the others. "'Whatever were you doing with that bird, Jem?' says she. "'Well,' said I, "'you said you'd give me one for Christmas, and I was feeling which one was the fattest.' "'Oh,' says she, "'we've set yours aside. Jem's bird, we call it. It's the big white one over yonder. There's twenty-six of them, which makes one for you, one for us, and two dozen for the market.' Thank you, Maggie, says I, but if it's all the same to you, I'd rather have the one that I was handling just now. The other is a good three pounds heavier, said she, and we fattened it expressly for you. Never mind, I'll have the other, and I'll take it now, said I. Oh, just as you like, said she, a little huffed. Which is it you want, then? That white one with the barred tail, right in the middle of the flock? Oh, very well. Kill it and take it with you. Well, I did what she said, Mr. Holmes, and I carried the bird all the way to Kilburn. I told my pal what I had done, for he was a man that it was easy to tell a thing like that to. He laughed until he choked, and we got a knife and opened the goose. My heart turned to water, for there was no sign of the stone, and I knew that some terrible mistake had occurred. I left the bird and rushed back to my sister's, hurried into the backyard. There was not a bird to be seen there. "'Where are they all, Maggie?' I cried. "'Gone to the dealers, Jem.' "'Which dealers?' "'Breckenridge of Covent Garden.' "'But was there another with a barred tail?' I asked. "'The same as the one I chose?' "'Yes, Jem. There were two barred-tailed ones. I could never tell them apart.' "'Well, then, of course, I saw it all, and I ran off as hard as my feet could carry me to this man, Breckenridge. "'But he had sold the lot at once, and not one word would he tell me as to where they had gone.' You heard him yourselves tonight. Well, he has always answered me like that. My sister thinks that I'm going mad. Sometimes I think that I am myself. And now, and now I am a branded thief without ever having touched the wealth for which I have sold my character. God help me, God help me. He burst into convulsive sobbing with his face buried in his hands. There was a long silence broken only by his heavy breathing and by the measured tapping of Sherlock Holmes's fingertips upon the edge of the table. Then my friend rose and threw open the door. Get out, said he. What, sir? Oh, heavens bless you. No more words. Get out. And no more words were needed. There was a rush, a clatter upon the stairs, the bang of a door, and the crisp rattle of running footfalls from the street. After all, Watson, said Holmes, reaching up his hands for his clay pipe, I am not retained by the police to supply their deficiencies. If Horner were in danger, it would be another thing. But this fellow would not appear against him, and the case must collapse. I suppose that I am commuting a felony, but it is just possible that I am saving a soul. This fellow will not go wrong again. He is too terribly frightened. Send him to jail now, and you make him a jailbird for life. Besides, it is the season of forgiveness. Chance has put in our way a most singular and whimsical problem, and its solution is its own reward. If you will have the goodness to touch the bell, Doctor, we will begin another investigation in which, also, a bird will be the chief feature. Who doesn't love some classic Sherlock Holmes? Uh-oh, it looks like you're out of apple cider. Yeah, I know, that last story was a little bit long. Sorry. You want more cider? Or, actually, are you are you warmed up now? Maybe time to stop with the hot drinks. I have some eggnog, if you prefer. You want that? I used to love eggnog as a kid. I, I still do. But it's delicious with a little splash of something extra. Of course, I, mean, I had virgin eggnog as a kid. <laughs> Well, you don't want eggnog in your mug, though. I'll get you a fresh glass. 
Actually, why don't you come with me to the kitchen again and I'll set up our next story on the way. I've got one more Christmas story for you today. This next story is from another famous author, L. Frank Baum. While his most popular story was The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, L. Frank Baum has written over 40 other novels, over 200 other poems, and over 80 other short stories. Hmm, where was the eggnog? Ah, there it is. Here, here's a glass for you. Where was I? Oh, that's right. Uh, Frank Baum's other works. Frank, that's what a lot of people call him. Actually, Frank went by a lot of names. That's probably one reason why you didn't notice that he wrote so much. You see, L. Frank Baum wrote a lot of his stories under pen names. So maybe you've seen some of the stories from George Brooks, Louis F. Baum, Laura Bancroft, Suzanne Metcalf, Captain Hugh Fitzgerald, Schuyler Staunton, Edith Van Dyne, Floyd Akers, or John Estes Cook. Any of those ring a bell? No? Okay, maybe not. But those are some of the pen names that the great L. Frank Baum used. Oh, and the L stands for Lyman, by the way. All right, now that we've got our eggnog, let's head back to the fireplace. Ah, cozy. I, I love sitting by the fireplace. Okay, let's get on with our final story. This is L. Frank Baum's Christmas story called A Kidnapped Santa Claus. Santa Claus lives in the Laughing Valley, where stands the big rambling castle in which his toys are manufactured. His workmen, selected from the Riles, Nooks, Pixies, and Fairies, live with him, and every one is as busy as can be from one year's end to another. It is called the Laughing Valley because everything there is so happy and gay. The brook chuckles to itself as it leaps, rollicking between its green banks. The wind whistles merrily in the trees. The sunbeams dance lightly over the soft grass, and the violets and wildflowers look smilingly up from their green nests. To laugh, one needs to be happy. To be happy, one needs to be content. And throughout the Laughing Valley of Santa Claus, contentment reigns supreme. On one side is the mighty forest of Burzee. At the other stands the huge mountain that contains the caves of the demons. And between them, the valley lies smiling and peaceful. One would think that our good old Santa Claus, who devotes his days to making children happy, would have no enemies on all the earth. And, as a matter of fact, for a long period of time, he encountered nothing but love wherever he might go. But the demons who live in the mountain caves grew to hate Santa Claus very much for all the simple reason that he made children happy. The caves of the demons are five in number. A broad pathway leads up to the first cave, which is a finely arched cavern at the foot of the mountain, the entrance being beautifully carved and decorated. In it resides the demon of selfishness. Back of this is another cavern inhabited by the demon of envy, the cave of the demon of hatred is next in order, and through this one passes to the home of the demon of malice, situated in a dark and fearful cave in the very heart of the mountain. I do not know what lies beyond this. Some say there are terrible pitfalls leading to death and destruction, and this very well may be true. However, from each one of the four caves mentioned, there is a small, narrow tunnel leading to the fifth cave, a cozy little room occupied by the demon of repentance. And the rocky floors of these passages are well worn by the tracking of passing feet. I judge that many wanderers in the caves of the demons have escaped through the tunnels to the abode of the demon of repentance, who is said to be a pleasant sort of fellow, who gladly opens for one a little door admitting you into fresh air and sunshine again. Well, these demons of the caves, thinking that they had great cause to dislike old Santa Claus, held a meeting one day to discuss the matter. I'm really getting lonesome, said the demon of selfishness, for Santa Claus distributes so many pretty Christmas gifts to all the children that they become happy and generous through his example and keep away from my cave. 
I'm having the same trouble, rejoined the demon of envy. The little ones seem quite content with Santa Claus, and there are very few, indeed, that I can coax to become envious. And that makes it bad for me, declared the demon of hatred, for if no children pass through the caves of selfishness and envy, none can get to my cavern. Or to mine, added the demon of malice. For my part, said the demon of repentance, it is easily seen that if children do not visit your caves, they have no need to visit mine, so that I am quite as neglected as you are. And all because of this person they call Santa Claus, exclaimed the demon of envy, he is simply ruining our business, and something must be done at once. To this they readily agreed, but what to do was another and more difficult matter to settle. They knew that Santa Claus worked all through the year at his castle in the Laughing Valley, preparing the gifts he was to distribute on Christmas Eve, and at first they resolved to try to tempt him into their caves, that they might lead him on the terrible pitfalls that ended in destruction. So, the very next day, while Santa Claus was busily at work, surrounded by his little band of assistants, the demon of selfishness came to him and said, These toys are wonderfully bright and pretty, but why do you not keep them for yourself? It's a pity to give them to these noisy boys and fretful girls who break and destroy them so quickly. Nonsense, cried the old graybeard, his bright eyes twinkling merrily as he turned toward the tempting demon. The boys and girls are never so noisy and fretful over receiving my presents, and if I can make them happy for one day in the year, I am quite content. So the demon went back to the others who awaited him in their caves and said, I have failed, for Santa Claus is not at all selfish. The following day, the demon of envy visited Santa Claus. Said he, The toy shops are full of playthings quite as pretty as those you are making. What a shame it is that they should interfere with your business. They make toys by machinery much quicker than you can make them by hand, and they sell them for money, while you get nothing at all for your work. But Santa Claus refused to be envious of the toy shops. I can supply the little ones but once a year, on Christmas Eve, he answered, for the children are many and I am but one. And as my work is one of love and kindness, I would be ashamed to receive money for my little gifts. But throughout all the year, the children must be amused in some way, and so the toy shops are able to bring much happiness to my little friends. I like the toy shops, and I'm glad to see them prosper. In spite of the second rebuff, the demon of hatred thought he would try to influence Santa Claus. So the next day, he entered the busy workshop and said, Good morning, Santa Claus. I have bad news for you. Then run away like a good fellow, answered Santa Claus. Bad news is something that should be kept secret and never told. You cannot escape this, however, declared the demon, for in the world there are a good many who do not believe in Santa Claus, and these you are bound to hate bitterly, since they have so wronged you. Stuff and rubbish, cried Santa, and there are others who resent your making children happy, and who sneer at you and call you a foolish old rattlepate. You are quite right to hate such base slanderers, and you ought to be revenged upon them for their evil words. But I don't hate them, exclaimed Santa positively. Such people do me no real harm, but merely render themselves and their children unhappy. Poor things. I'd much rather help them any day than injure them. Indeed, the demons could not tempt old Santa Claus in any way. On the contrary, he was shrewd enough to see that their object in visiting him was to make mischief and trouble, and his cheery laughter disconcerted the evil ones and showed to them the folly of such an undertaking. So they abandoned honeyed words and determined to use force. It was well known that no harm can come to Santa Claus while he is in the Laughing Valley, for the fairies, the riles, the nooks all protect him. But on Christmas Eve, he drives his reindeer out into the big world, carrying a sleigh load of toys and pretty gifts to the children. And this was the time and the occasion when his enemies had the best chance to injure him. So the demons laid their plans and waited the arrival of Christmas Eve. The moon shone big and white in the sky, and the snow lay crisp and sparkling on the ground as Santa Claus cracked his whip and sped away out of the mountain into the great world beyond. The roomy sleigh was packed full with huge sacks of toys, and as the reindeer dashed onward, our jolly old Santa laughed and whistled and sang for very joy. For in all his merry life, this was the one day in the year when he was the happiest the day he lovingly bestowed the treasures of his workshop upon the little children. It would be a busy night for him, 
he well knew. As he whistled and shouted and cracked his whip again, he reviewed and mined all the towns and cities and farmhouses where he was expected and figured that he had just enough presents to go around and make every child happy. The reindeer knew exactly what was expected of them and dashed along so swiftly that their feet scarcely seemed to touch the snow-covered ground. Suddenly, a strange thing happened. A rope shot through the moonlight and a big noose that was on the end of it settled over the arms and body of Santa Claus and drew tight. Before he could resist or even cry out, he was jerked from the seat of the sleigh and tumbled head foremost into the snowbank while the reindeer rushed onward with the load of toys and carried it quickly out of sight and sound. Such a surprising experience confused old Santa for a moment, and when he had collected his senses, he found that the wicked demons had pulled him from the snowdrift and bound him tightly with many coils of stout rope. And then they carried the kidnapped Santa Claus away to their mountain, where they thrust the prisoner into a secret cave and chained him to the rocky wall so that he could not escape. Ha <laughs> ha, laughed the demons, rubbing their hands together with cruel glee. What would the children do now? How will they cry and scold and storm where they find there are no toys in their stockings and no gifts on their Christmas trees? And what a lot of punishment they will receive from their parents and how they will flock to our caves of selfishness and envy and hatred and malice. We have done a mighty clever thing, we the demons of the caves. Now it so chanced that on this Christmas Eve, the good Santa Claus had taken with him in his sleigh Nutter the Ryle, Peter the Nook, and Kilter the Pixie, and a small fairy named Whisk, his four favorite assistants. These little people he had often found very useful in helping him to distribute his gifts to the children, and when their master was so suddenly dragged from the sleigh, they were all snugly tucked underneath the seat, where the sharp wind could not reach them. The tiny immortals knew nothing of the capture of Santa Claus until some time after he had disappeared, but finally they missed his cheery voice, and as their master always sang or whistled upon his journeys, the silence warned them that something was wrong. Little Whisk stuck out his head from underneath the seat and found Santa Claus gone. There was no one to direct the flight of the reindeer. Whoa, he called out, and the deer obediently slackened speed and came to a halt. Peter and Neuter and Kilter all jumped on the seat and looked back over the track made by the sleigh, but Santa Claus had been left miles and miles behind. What shall we do? asked Whisk anxiously. All the mirth and mischief banished from his wee face by this great calamity. We must go back at once and find our master, said Neuter the Ryle, who thought and spoke with much deliberation. No, no, exclaimed Peter the Nook, who, cross and crabbed though he was, might always be dependent upon an emergency. If we delay or go back, there will not be time to get the toys to the children before morning, and that would grieve Santa Claus more than anything else. It is certain that some wicked creatures have captured him, added Kilter thoughtfully, and their object must be to make the children unhappy. So our first duty is to get the toys distributed as carefully as if Santa Claus were present himself. Afterward, we can search for our master and easily secure his freedom. This seemed such good and sensible advice that the others at once resolved to adopt it. So Peter the Nook called to the reindeer, and the faithful animals again sprang forward and dashed over hill and valley, through forest and plain, until they came to the houses wherein children lay sleeping and dreaming of the pretty gifts they would find on Christmas morning. The little immortals had set themselves a difficult task, for although they had assisted Santa Claus on many of his journeys, their master had always directed and guided them and told them exactly what he wished them to do. But now they had to distribute the toys according to their own judgment, and they did not understand children as well as did old Santa. So it is no wonder that they made some laughable errors. Mamie Brown, who wanted a doll, got a drum instead. A drum is of no use to a girl who loves dolls. And Charlie Smith, who delights to romp and play outdoors, and who wanted some new rubber boots to keep his feet dry, received a sewing box filled with colored worsteds and threads and needles, and made him so provoked that he thoughtlessly called our dear Santa Claus a fraud. Had there been many such mistakes, the demons would have accomplished their evil purpose and made the children unhappy. But the little friends of the absent Santa Claus labored faithfully and intelligently to carry out their master's ideas, and they made fewer errors than might be expected under such unusual circumstances. And, although they worked as swiftly as possible, day had begun to break before the toys and other presents were all distributed, 
So for the first time in many years, the reindeer trotted into Laughing Valley on their return in broad daylight, with the brilliant sun peering over the edge of the forest to prove they were far behind their accustomed hours. Having put their deer in the stable, the little folk began to wonder how they might rescue their master, and they realized they must discover, first of all, what had happened to him and where he was. So Whisk, the fairy, transported himself to the bower of the fairy queen, which was located deep in the heart of the forest of Burzi. And once there, it did not take him long to find out all about the naughty demons and how they had kidnapped the good Santa Claus to prevent his making children happy. The fairy queen also promised her assistance and then, fortified by this powerful support, Whisk flew back to where Neuter and Peter and Kilter awaited him and the four counseled together and laid plans to rescue their master from his enemies. It is possible that Santa Claus was not as merry as usual during the night that succeeded his capture, for although he had faith in the judgment of his little friends, he could not avoid a certain amount of worry and an anxious look would creep at times to his kind old eyes as he thought of the disappointment that might await his dear little children. And the demons, who guarded him by turns one after another, did not neglect to taunt him with contemptuous words in his helpless condition. When Christmas Day dawned, the demon of malice was guarding the prisoner, and his tongue was sharper than that of any others. "'The children are waking up, Santa,' he cried." They are waking up to find their stockings empty. Ho, ho! They will quarrel and quail and stamp their feet in anger. Our caves will be full today, old Santa. Our caves are sure to be full. But to this, as to the other taunts, Santa Claus answered nothing. He was much grieved by his capture, it is true, but his courage did not forsake him. And finding that the prisoner would not reply to his jeers, the demon of malice presently went away and sent the demon of repentance to take his place. This last personage was not so disagreeable as the others. He had gentle and refined features, and his voice was soft and pleasant in tone. My brother, demons do not trust me overmuch, he said, as he entered the cavern. But it is morning now, and the mischief is done. You cannot visit the children again for another year. That is true, answered Santa Claus, almost cheerfully. Christmas Eve has passed, and for the first time in centuries I have not visited my children. The little ones will be greatly disappointed, murmured the demon of repentance, almost regretfully. But that cannot be helped now. Their grief is likely to make the children selfish and envious and hateful. And if they come to the caves of the demons today, I shall get a chance to lead some of them to my cave of repentance. Do you never repent yourself? asked Santa, curiously. Oh yes, indeed, answered the demon. I am even now repenting that I assisted in your capture. Of course, it is too late to remedy the evil that has been done. But repentance, you know, can only come after an evil thought or deed. For in the beginning, there is nothing to repent of. So, I understand, said Santa Claus. Those who avoid evil need never visit your cave. As a rule, that is true, replied the demon. Yet you, who have done no evil, are about to visit my cave at once. For to prove that I sincerely regret my share in your capture, I am going to permit you to escape. This speech greatly surprised the prisoner until he reflected that it was just what might be expected of the demon of repentance. The fellow at once busied himself untying the knots that bound Santa Claus and unlocking the chains that fastened him to the wall. He then led the way through a long tunnel until they both emerged in the cave of repentance. I hope you will forgive me said the demon pleadingly. I am not really a bad person, you know, and I believe I accomplish a great deal of good in the world. With this, he opened the back door and let in a flood of sunshine, and Santa Claus sniffed the fresh air gratefully. I bear no malice, he said to the demon in a gentle voice, and I am sure the world would be a dreary place without you. So good morning, and a Merry Christmas to you. With these words, he stepped out to greet the bright morning, and a moment later, he was trudging along, whistling softly to himself, on his way to his home in the Laughing Valley. Marching over the snow toward the mountain was a vast army made up of the most curious creatures imaginable. There were numberless nooks from the forest, as rough and crooked in appearance as the gnarled branches of the trees they ministered to, and there were dainty riles from the fields, each one bearing the emblem of the flower or plant it guarded. 
Behind these were many ranks of pixies, gnomes, and nymphs, and in the rear a thousand beautiful fairies floated along in gorgeous array. This wonderful army was led by Whisk, Peter, Neuter, and Kilter, who had assembled it to rescue Santa Claus from captivity and to punish the demons who had dared take him away from his beloved children. And, although they looked so bright and peaceful, these little immortals were armed with powers that would be very terrible to those who had incurred their anger. Woe to the demons of the caves if this mighty army of vengeance ever met them. But lo, coming to meet his loyal friends appeared the imposing form of Santa Claus, his white beard floating in the breeze and his bright eyes sparkling with pleasure at this proof of the love and veneration he had inspired in the hearts of the most powerful creatures in existence. And while they clustered around him and danced with glee at his safe return, he gave them earnest thanks for their support. But Whisk and Neuter and Peter and Kilter he embraced affectionately. It is useless to pursue the demons, said Santa Claus to the army. They have their place in the world and can never be destroyed. But that is a great pity, nevertheless, he continued musingly. So the fairies and nooks and pixies and riles all escorted the man to his castle, and there left him to talk over the events of the night with his little assistance. Whisk had already rendered himself invisible and flown through the big world to see how the children were getting along on this bright Christmas morning. And by the time he returned, Peter had finished telling Santa Claus of how they had distributed the toys. We really did very well, cried the fairy in a pleased voice, for I found little unhappiness among the children this morning. Still, you must not get captured again, my dear master for we might not be so fortunate another time in carrying out your ideas. He then related the mistakes that had been made, and which he had not discovered until his tour of inspection, and Santa Claus at once had sent him with rubber boots for Charlie Smith and a doll for Mamie Brown, so that even those two disappointed ones became happy. As for the wicked demons of the caves, they were filled with anger and chagrin when they found that their clever capture of Santa Claus had come to naught. Indeed, no one on that Christmas day appeared to be at all selfish or envious or hateful, and realizing that while the children's saint had so many powerful friends, it was folly to oppose him. The demons never again attempted to interfere with his journeys on Christmas Eve. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me. Well, except for the stories that weren't. <laughs> I know this episode was a little bit different than the other episodes that we've had, but since Christmas Day falls on release day for this podcast on Monday, I wanted to do something special. I hope you enjoyed these three Christmas stories as much as I enjoyed sharing them with you. Whether you're listening to this on Christmas Day or saving this episode for a little after, thank you so much for spending a bit of your Christmas season with me. From my family to yours, have a very Merry Christmas. Christmas.